Now, after months of deliberations, most of the world's nations have signed up to a historic deal to ensure big companies pay a fairer share of tax. According to the Organization for Export Cooperation and Development, uh, its members have agreed to set a global corporate minimum tax rate of 15% effective from 2023. The landmark deal agreed by 136 countries and jurisdictions representing more than 90% of global GDP will also reallocate more than 125 billion US dollars of profit from around 100 of the world's largest and most profitable multinational enterprises or multinational corporations to countries worldwide, ensuring that these firms pay a fair share of tax wherever they operate and generate profits. A key factor in concluding the deal was gaining the support of Ireland and uh, other small countries that had used low corporate tax rates as an incentive for large companies to relocate from higher tax jurisdictions. But to discuss this and give an in-depth analysis into what this means and the impact on Nigeria's economy uh, in West, I'm going to be speaking to the West Africa tax leader at Deloitte, uh, Mr. Yomi Olubenro. Good afternoon, Mr. Olubenro. Good afternoon, Tolu. Great to be with you on your show. Yes. Uh, when I saw this release yesterday, <laughs> I knew that, yes, a lot. there's a lot to talk about. But let's start with the conversation around global minimum corporate tax rate, uh, which has been a front-burning issue for a while now. Well, finally, we see major reforms of international tax systems finalized with a minimum 15% tax rate from 2023. Now, what do you make of the lines of engagement, resolutions, and then its impact on the global business climate. Yeah, absolutely. So um, this this is a landmark uh, and, and groundbreaking resolution by the OECD and, and the international community. Um, there has been a long search for, you know, um, a more fairer and equitable contribution by multinational companies that are operating all around the world. Uh, particularly within the context of the digitalized and the globalized world, right? So, um, as, as, as the economy becomes more globalized and, and multinational companies, you know, are more digital, uh, taxing authorities around the world have found challenges, you know, in being able to bring many of them to tax because of the absence of uh, uh, physical infrastructure, you know, what we call physical presence. So you, you have multinational companies making billions of money in different areas of the world, in different parts of the world, where they are not physically represented. So the search for how do we make these multinationals to pay um, uh, contributions that are reflective of the, of the business that they are doing in, 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 in those jurisdictions. That's, that's what led to uh, this resolution you are having. So the, the global minimum tax of 15% is just one of the two pillar solutions that was, that was agreed. And, and what it means is that uh, for many of the multinational companies, once you have uh, over 750 million uh, euro in annual revenue, um, you are now bound by, by this new rule that at least your effective corporate tax uh, shouldn't be lower than uh, 15%. So that means um, a lot more that will be available for uh, the local economy where these businesses are operating, and that, 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 that will mean uh, many economies will, will, will benefit from that. Uh, from the data, from the conversation we're having, um, you may be having close to 150 billion US dollar additional tax revenue uh, that is made available by this groundbreaking resolution. That's, that's on, the, on, on the first pillar alone. So it's a welcome development. Um, many developing economy uh, will, will, will benefit from this, particularly uh, countries that are having it uh, a lot more tough, you know, in being able to track uh, multinational companies. So, um, but the, 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 the second pillar also um, even goes further to, to, to make this possible. So that's, that's the pillar that now try to unify uh, the, the rule for taxing uh, many multinational companies. So th what that rule is seeking to do is to make sure that countries no longer have to uh, rely on unilateral provisions for digital services tax, right? So if, if you remember uh, the introduction we have in our Finance Act, um, in, in 2020, um, we brought in what we call significant economic presence. And that response was because 
many multinational companies that are making money in Nigeria do not have digital uh, physical presence, and based on the rules as it was then, uh, they probably would not have been liable to any tax at all, and that, and that's where the uh, significant economic presence comes through, which is a form of digital services tax. So you have many jurisdictions around the world coming out with similar provisions to subject a uh, digital player within uh, this new globalized world to digital services tax. Uh, but the, the many multinational companies, on the other hand, are complaining over you know, different rules, different rates, and you know, how to do um, reconciliations and, 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 and also be able to focus on their business. So the, the multilateral agreement, in a way, it, it, it's a way to make sure that countries no longer need to focus on um, single-handedly finding re response or answer to this, uh, you know, global question. So the world has come together, OECD, the G20 economy, and at least 140 countries, even though about uh, 136 are the only ones that have signed, Nigeria will have committed to it. Nigeria is one of the four uh, that hasn't really committed to this new agreement. Uh, but what it means is that for the real large multinational companies, um, and we're talking about companies that have uh, over 20 mil, uh, billion euro, you know, in, 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 in annual sales. So there's now a new rule that makes for redistribution of certain percentage of, of their profit to all of these uh, countries where they operate so that in, in exchange for that, many of those jurisdictions will no longer then have to have um, maybe digital services back and those unilateral provision. So it's a welcome development. Uh, it's a global response. Um, many countries are still, you know, trying to uh, dimension how this impacts them and whether, you know, the unilateral response will be, you know, a more, uh, a, a stronger response from their own local economy. And, and, and that's why you have uh, at least four jurisdictions still uh, trying to study before, before they get into the ring. Hmm. Beautiful way to start the conversation. Uh, great insight there, uh, Mr. Lugbenro. But now, as part of this landmark deal, you mentioned that too in your submission, that we see a reallocation of more than uh, $125 billion of profit around 100 of the world's largest and most profitable multinational enterprises uh, to countries worldwide. Now, how do you see the reallocation of some taxing rights playing out, especially for home countries where multinationals, of course, run their market and end profit, regardless of whether firms have a physical presence there. Yeah, so uh, the, the, the guidelines actually provide um, the metrics for, for, for doing this. So first of all, the reason why you have uh, just about a hundred multinational company mentioned in, uh, in, in, in that piece where you are referring to is because there are threshold of revenue uh, that makes you fall within that bracket. So, for example, uh, a multinational company must have at least 20 billion euro in annual sales and a minimum of about 10 percent of that in its annual profits to be eligible. And so you, we're really talking about the large, you know, uh, sized uh, multinational enterprises. So from the initial data, there will be just about a hundred or a little above that that will qualify um, to, to, be, to be part of those entities that will be uh, sharing what we call their residual profit. And how is the residual profit calculated? So whatever profit that such multinational companies report over the 10 percent that we have made, you know, so if, if I use the example that I, that, that I have said, 20 billion euro in annual sales, 10 percent of that is 2 billion um, euro, for example. So you have a multinational company that have over 2 billion euro in annual profit. Now, a quarter of whatever they make over the two billion is then uh, available for redistribution um, among all of the countries or between all of the countries where uh, these businesses uh, operate. Um, based on the based on the initial data and and, 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 and calculation, so it is expected that uh, this multinational company will have generated about a million euro. Uh, uh, in annual revenue from each of those jurisdictions to be eligible to participate in, you know, the redistribution of that taxing right. And that's where a number of countries, particularly developing countries, including Nigeria, that's where they are beginning, I mean, countries are beginning to evaluate, to say, look, uh, how many of these multinational companies actually fall within that bracket, within our jurisdiction? Because once we sign up to that agreement, what it means is that our own local role for taxing multinational company, the digital services tax may no longer be applicable. And a number of countries are you know, quite uncomfortable uh, with, with, with this. And it's one of the areas where Nigeria is reviewing to say, look, 
with our significant economic presence role, um, once a, a, a multinational company, a digital uh, a player within the digital space, make over 25 million naira, it means you are eligible to pay tax in Nigeria. Now, compare that threshold with having to uh, generate a million uh, euro in annual sale within the, within the economy. So countries are evaluating uh, to make sure that this, this, this principle, this rule, this new landmark agreement is not just favoring the large economies where uh, these large multinationals are heavily present. So we, Nigeria needed to be sure. Nigeria hasn't uh, committed to it. Kenya hasn't committed to it. Uh, Pakistan and Sri Lanka is, uh, you know, uh, make the four countries that are here to, to, to come on board. But overall, uh, we think for the global economy, it's, it's, it's a landmark um, uh, agreement that, that that's, uh, is worth applauding. Hmm. Great stuff there. Now, do, do you share in the sentiments and uh, optimism that uh, this move will bring further benefits, of course, and stabilize the international tax system, increase tax certainty for taxpayers and, and tax administration? Do you think along that line? No, absolutely. So if, if you look at it from the predictability and certainty it brings to uh, the corporate taxpayer, the multinational company, they definitely will provide. Uh, provide this approach, you know, so uh, they no longer have to deal with uh, different jurisdictions uh, around the world to, you know, to negotiate what what should be the an appropriate rate for uh, digital services tax, uh, what should be an appropriate threshold, uh, at what point do I need to register, what is my filing obligation, so there is a common global methodology for assessing multinational companies to tax, and that predictability, uh, that certainty, that clarity is always good for business, so so um, that's part of the, 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 the critical pillar of, of a sound and effective tax system. You want a system that is predictable. So you want to do your annual plan. You want to do your strategy. You want a situation where you no longer have to rely on you know, what um, certain um, uh, developing economy or, or large economy have to say as far as your, your business operation is concerned. So from, from, from a global business perspective, from a, you know, uh, looking at it from that perspective, it's a, it's, it's, it's a welcome development. The certainty um, and, and the clarity it brings is it, 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 extremely strong. Great. Now, let's bring the conversation back home. Addressing tax challenges uh, arising from digitalization of the economy is moving at a different pace than what we have here in Nigeria and what other low-income countries uh, go through. Now, what are some of our biggest mistakes from your perspective and what reforms do you see or do you want to see in our tax system domestically? Well, I, I think the pain we, we, we have or, or the challenges we have uh, in, in the area of taxing the uh, player within the digital economy is, is, is quite common to what uh, most developing countries, in fact, even developed uh, nations have. And, and that's the fact that the original construct of our legislation, it's, it's only suitable for your traditional brick and mortar business. You know, so in almost every jurisdiction of the world, um, the principle that brings your corporate uh, profits to tax is typically um, the physical presence, so which requires that you, you, know, you have your office, you have your structure uh, within the local economy, and on the basis of that, you are you know, locally registered. Um, in Nigeria, for example, um, in line with the rule of uh, the Companies Online, Online Matters Act, and when you are registered, you know, you, 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 you then pay your uh, corporate income tax. But unfortunately, business moved away from brick and mortar, and our tax system didn't respond as quickly as it should. Mm -hmm. A number of other countries responded quite um, much uh, faster than we did, but we also eventually came um, in, 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 into, the, into the ring with the amendment to uh, you know, a tax legislation via the Finance Act. So that's part of, that's, that, that was part of the problem. Now, um, a number of people will mention issues relating to the threshold that was introduced in the Finance Act, whether it was low um, and whether we could have raised the buy bid. But I think the, 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 the logic that you know, um, drove the, the 25 million uh, Naira revenue threshold was because that was the same threshold that was used for my, uh, small business uh, tax exemption. So if you remember the exemption we have uh, to uh, companies income tax. So companies that are generating that same level of uh, revenue are then seen as small business and, and, and have a certain level of exemption. So, but it's only at the point where Nigeria is now fashioning out 
how to operationalize uh, that provision because we haven't actually moved that far. Um, we're now at a level where we're trying to operationalize that provision and try to see um, that many multinational companies pay a fair and equitable uh, percentage of their earnings uh, in, in, in local taxes. That's when we then have this rule uh, land, landing on the table. And I guess that's part of the reason why uh, the taxing authority and the, and the Minister of Finance are saying, look, a lot more conversation needs to happen uh, to see whether there are ways we could uh, negotiate you know, a, a better threshold or whether we could evaluate um, what the size of the business of many of these um, um, uh, players within the digital space, what is the size of their business, and then to be able to quantify whether we're going to be a net gainer or a, le a net loser uh, in, in, in the short term. But my, my perspective is that beyond uh, whatever is the, is the result of that analysis from a tax revenue perspective, we also need to look at it from a much broader um, economic perspective. So what is the impact on you know, driving in foreign direct investment? So if the rules are clearer, um, if they are more predictable, if there's a lot of certainty and the, the process is respected, the process is streamlined, just like it is done in many other parts of the world, uh, we may just be positioning the country to, you know, to, to, to receive more inflow by, by, by way of FDIs and, and multinational company wanting to do a lot more business uh, within our space. And finally, before I let you go now, uh, with conversations and deliberations of the Finance Bill 2022 in motion, of course, to accompany the 2022 budget, what sort of shifts do you expect with regards to revenue generation through improved tax systems? Right. Uh, it's, it's the Finance Bill 2021, actually. So, um, yeah, 2021. So it's, a lot of, yeah, a lot of consultation are, 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 are going on now. Um, part, part of the uh, measure that I believe will be on the table is to revisit some of the some of the propositions that eventually didn't make it to finance uh, the Finance Act 2020 um, because of the prevailing uh, economic uh, situation. If, if you recall, uh, with the Finance Act 2019 bringing in you know an increase in the VAT rate, there were a lot of conversations prior to the signing of the, of, 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 of the Finance Act 2020 whether there would be a gradual increase. Uh, in the VAT rate, but that idea was stopped because the prevailing economic situation then was not right for uh, an increase in tax rate. I know that that conversation will be back on the table and there will be a re-evaluation of whether um, we have gotten to a point where there's some, some, some measure of um, um, stability and whether that rate could, could, could go on further. Uh, my personal guess or my, my, my personal take would be that we probably still need to take um, a chill um, probably for uh, one more year to be able to you know, allow the prevailing uh, pandemic impact on business to subside uh, uh, more substantially. And then uh, hoping that some of the conversations that have been going on regarding the fiscal federalism, particularly the issue of VAT, uh, which, which, which is, which is uh, currently within the court system, whether part of that um, um, amendment uh, that we need to make, uh, be it to the constitution, uh, be it to our, our, our taxing, taxing laws, maybe some of those amendments can, 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 can come in. A lot of uh, proposals coming in from uh, MAN, coming in from um, other sectors of the economy, uh, everybody trying to ask for um, a, a relook at provisions that appear to be um, may, maybe hampering business in, in, in a particular way. Overall, I think the focus, um, if there's going to be a theme uh, for the Finance Bill 2021, uh, I think the focus should be how can we use the instrumentality of our tax system to drive in a lot more uh, corporate capital you know, into, in, into the country. Uh, if we do that, um, we, will, we will have expanded the space. Uh, for for the economy to bounce back and for us to actually go back uh, to, to to growth that can be more sustainable uh, for for employment generation and for tackling many of our critical uh, challenges in the country. African tax leader Deloitte, Mr. Yomi Olugmero, thank you very much for making sense of this very important topic to us and of course Nigerians and our other viewers. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be with you.